Good evening, radio astronomers. Um, good to see again our friends from across the Atlantic. And um, you're all very welcome on this call this evening. And for the several hundred of you that will be joining in the next couple of weeks on YouTube, you're also very welcome. Um, I'm, I'm Paul Hearn, the, uh, the director of the radio astronomy section in the um, radio uh, Astronomy Association. Um, next next month, we've got uh, Professor Jim Madsen joining us, and he'll be talking to us about the uh, the low frequency array and how that can inform our understanding of um, of uh, supermassive black holes. Quite a, a a topical subject just at the moment. Um, later later this evening, um, I'm going to invite Andrew Thomas to. Uh, continue our discussion tonight on muons, um, but it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor uh, Professor Lee Thompson. Um, we've had quite a few theoretical astrophysicists uh, ad address us on these seminars. Um, tonight uh, we've got Professor Thompson, who who describes himself as a um, as, 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 a, uh, as an experimental astrophysicist looking to apply astrophysics to real world problems. So um, Lee, you are very welcome. Um, you should have the ability to share your screen and uh, it, it's over to you. Oh, hopefully you can all see that. Yes, that worked. Splendid, okay. So I'll just go into presentation mode on that. Is it going to let me to do that? Should do. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Thanks very much for the um, <clears throat> thanks very much for the introduction. So um, as Paula said, my name is Lee Thompson. I'm an experimental particle physicist at the University of Sheffield. Um, uh, I also uh, kind of wearing two hats tonight because uh, recently, along with uh, four other colleagues of um, I've actually formed a spin-out company based on the technology I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I spent most of my career doing experimental particle physics in places like CERN in Geneva, uh, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, and more recently um, as part of the Japanese neutrino program out, uh, out in Japan. Uh, but I've always um, enjoyed uh, the experimental side of things, and uh, it's really nice uh, as I, as I moved to uh, the twilight of my career to uh, actually find some uh, real application uh, to the work I've been doing in pursuit of uh, knowledge on the particle physics side of things. And I want to share that with you tonight. So uh, the, really the sort of topic of the discussion tonight is it's all going to be about muons. And uh, those muons um, are uh, actually interesting particles in their own right. They're uh, but what the muons we're going to talk about here are the muons that are created in our upper atmosphere. So uh, what happens is primary cosmic rays, you talk, you, you said you're going to speak coming next week talking about various things like supermassive black holes. These primary cosmic rays are largely charged nuclei, anything from protons right up to iron nuclei that got stripped of their electrons and accelerated in, in, in the solar system various sources, including our own, own sun, but for the more energetic primary cosmic rays, sources including things like blazars, active galactic nuclei, etc. These enter our atmosphere. They can have uh, energies up to joules. Uh, so uh, I always make the point that, uh, you know, a tennis ball served at about 50 miles an hour is roughly about what you're talking. So that's a very macroscopic uh, energy. And it's, I find it remarkable to think that a sort of simple proton or a small nucleus of, a, uh, of, of an element, single nucleus could have those sorts of energies. So they, some of these things get um, accelerated up to gigantic energies. They enter our Earth's atmosphere and as the atmosphere starts thickening, typically about 10 to 15 kilometers out, they initiate, usually interact with the nitrogen molecule and initiate a shower of particles. And a number of things happen in that shower, but the main thing from the point of view of um, conversation tonight. The talk tonight is going to be that uh, a lot of the uh, particles we see at ground level are so-called secondary cosmic rays. These secondary cosmic rays are highly penetrating and uh, whenever I give a public lecture I say hold out your hand and look at your thumbnail and you have a cosmic ray passing through an area the size of your thumbnail every minute and that counts for every 
not just your thumbnail, of course, uh, as well. So they are very plentiful. From the point of view of today's talk, the main one of the main features of the cosmic rays that's of particular interest, these cosmic ray muons, is that they're very they're very penetrating. So um, we use them in uh, we use them in two different techniques. Uh, it's slightly confusing because the term muon tomography tends to be an umbrella term for two different techniques. Um, so the one I'm mainly going to talk about today, I would personally call muon radiography to differentiate it from the other. I'll make that clear a bit later in the talk. But uh, what I want you to realise with uh, this technique I'm going to talk about uh, now um, and, and focus on for a large chunk of the talk is if you understand the concept behind a medical x-ray, you understand muon radiography. Um, so with a medical x-ray, if you think about it, you have three things. You have a, an object of interest that you want to uh, ideally non-invasively uh, image, and in particular, you're interested in density variations in that image. You have a beam of particles that passes that object of interest. So in the case of a medical x-ray, you go into the dental surgery and the dentist wants to see what your system, what the problem is with your teeth and wants to maybe look at the root canal system. So he brings, uh, as in the uh, right hand image there, brings that device up. You bite on that awful thing that uh, you have to bite on and hold still, uh, which is a detector. It's actually, a, you know, at, at the end of the day, that's just very simply uh, uh, an X-ray detector. So there you have the three things. You have the thing you want to image, the beam of particles and the detector. And uh, that process is exactly the same in the case of uh, muon radiography or muon attenuation tomography. Like X-rays, muons are highly penetrating particles. And, and furthermore, the dentist or the uh, hospital has to actually buy the X-ray source. In this case, the source of the penetrating particles is free. So just like an X-ray, um, I, I guess the one snag with all this is uh, your X, your, your, in this case, your penetrating particles, your muons either come from the vertical or all the way towards the horizontal, but they don't come from below. So one of the things you can't do, one of the limitations of the technique is you can't image by looking down, but as long as you can place detectors either to the side or underneath the object you wish to image, then you're able to, in principle, make a density image using uh, cosmic ray muons. Now, one of the things I like to point out in this type of talk is this, this is by no means uh, a new technique. Um, it, it's, it's certainly a technique that's going through a renaissance, there's no question about it, but uh, the first documented um, record of its application is back in 1955, where a scientist in, at the University of Sydney actually used the technique to uh, measure the overburden above a tunnel system uh, around a hydroelectric power station in New South Wales. So, as I say, by no means a new technique. Um, it kind of went quiet a bit, certainly from a, from a, a point of view of uh, if you do a literature search until about 1970, where, where uh, a character called Louis Alvarez, who's a really um, interesting character in his own right, uh, first proposed the application of um, neon tomography for the imaging of hidden chambers in pyramids. And therein, I think, what happens here is you actually sort of see some of the benefits behind this technique, because obviously one of the things you ideally want to do if you want to learn more about the pyramids, and particularly the, 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 the structure of the pyramid, if there are any hidden chambers that are not until previously discovered, ideally you want to do that in a, both a non-invasive and non-destructive way. And that's really one of the linchpins of the technique, one of its appeals uh, in the applications that we use. So um, Alvarez didn't find any um, hidden chambers, sadly, but uh, if we fast forward to 2017, some of you may remember um, these sorts of articles that appeared um, Got the one on the right from the BBC News website, but uh, this sort of um, um, this story, uh, uh, which was as a result of a, a, a paper printed in Nature, which I was fortunate enough to be asked to referee, uh, actually sort of did make the world press. And this was really the first um, recent, I would say, yeah, in, in recent times, high profile application of muon tomography, wherein the technique was used. Uh, and in this case, three different teams went in using different instrumentation, one inside the pyramid and two others outside the pyramid uh, to actually uh, image the Khufu's Great Pyramid of Giza and indeed um, a, a chamber that hadn't hitherto 
been uh, observed uh, was actually detected uh, by the instrumentation. Some of the other sort of more high profile, if you like, applications of the technique. Um, colleagues in Japan for some years now have been uh, using uh, the technique in, um, in volcanology. I said you can't get under the, uh, you have to get either under or to the side of the object of interest. So this is one of those instances where you get to the side of the object of interest uh, and you image through the volcano uh, to actually uh, look at density changes. Um, this has been really pioneering work uh, from the colleagues in Japan. Um, and one of the things that they've done is uh, uh, been able to actually uh, follow uh, an eruption effectively in real time uh, and take, albeit as is clear, you can see from the time sequence here, uh, rather coarse information, but then nevertheless uh, uh, be able to actually say something about the density movements within the volcano during the actual uh, eruption process. And, and here's a little image I managed to uh, pull off from the paper. There's a large description underneath that. I'm not going to read it out to you, but it just actually goes to show the sort of uh, level of information that was even achieved here. So this is this is the uh, this particular a volcano starting its eruption. The team got on site around June the 13th and then by June the 14th and 15th, their uh, tomography uh, system was re re returning information. And you can see that as time goes on, it is albeit coarse resolution, but in principle, you can actually sort of see um, that there's uh, changes particularly uh, in, in and around the magma column uh, around the various eruptions and uh, uh, certainly um, information there that was of use to the volcanologists and geologists in terms of understanding the underlying processes that are taking place. Now this work, um, this, this colleague uh, Tanaka in, 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 in Japan has really uh, pioneered this technique and, and is looking now to sort of um, deploy instrumentation that will return much higher fidelity uh, images of this type of occurrence. So what I want to spend a little bit of time talking to you today about is when I uh, introduce myself, I introduce myself jointly as a, an academic at the University of Sheffield and also a, a director of um, a spin-out company called Geoptic. And uh, one of the main areas of work for Geoptic, um, and it's, it's really a nice case study of the sort of things that the tomography can, um, can address, is uh, within the UK railway infrastructure. So I'm just going to spend a couple of slides really giving you a bit of uh, background to the problem and then explain how muon tomography can help the problem. So uh, within the UK, our railway infrastructure is one of the largest in the world. We have over 15,000 kilometres of track and more than 2,000 tunnels, bridges and viaducts. Uh, the problem is, as, as you know, I'm sure many of you are aware, much of the infrastructure is Victorian in origin um, and therefore there is a need for regular inspection. And I think this, these two these two images here really exemplify uh, that enormous, enormous um, boom in the building of the railways in the Victorian era. Uh, and what happened in such a short space of time, just 60 years between those two images. And if you think how long it's going to take us to get HS2, you do realise how remarkable this, this, this time was. Now, the more I learn about the Victorians, the more I realise how clever they were. They had some fabulous construction methods. One might naively assume that they um, they excavated their tunnels from the two ends. Well, indeed, they did that, but they soon learned that it was more efficient as well to, for example, drop construction shafts down the tunnel, sometimes just one, sometimes multiple, along the line of the tunnel. And then they would work out from that construction shaft uh, as well. Uh, in order to expedite the actual um, uh, excavation of the tunnel. Now, these shafts, uh, what happened to them is a little bit random. Sometimes they were filled, sometimes they were capped, and sometimes they're left open. So you can see examples. There's a modern day example in the bottom left there of uh, uh, at one of these construction shafts left open to the surface. Uh, in other instances, as I'll show you in a minute, you can walk into a railway tunnel 
and stand and look up to blue sky because the shaft has been left open both at both the top and the bottom of the tunnel. But in other cases, uh, the tunnel would have been uh, capped inside, actually, uh, on the tunnel, what they call the tunnel lining. And therefore, you have, to all intents and purposes, to the eye, what looks like a normal tunnel, but behind it, there may be a partial or a full void. And that is a concern to the railway industry, obviously, um, because uh, that void, can, you can get water ingress in that void, and there's potential uh, problems with the structural integrity of that void. Importantly, very few, um, very few records exist. And so as a consequence, Network Rail is obliged to do a lot of checks on this, where, where there are suspected voids. Um, what can go wrong? Well, I once showed this in the presence of a tunnel asset manager, a Network Rail tunnel asset manager, and he got very cross with me because he said, you know, this, ha this has happened once in the last 50 or 60 years. And the reason it doesn't happen regularly is we do actually have a, a regular uh, maintenance uh, program that assures us that uh, this isn't going to happen again. And, and so I always actually um, suffix what I show here with that statement. So, but nevertheless, in 1953, in Clifton Hall, in Swin near Swinton, in Manchester, there was a collapse into one of these hidden voids, uh, which resulted in two houses collapsing and five deaths. Now, as I, I will just read the uh, read the rider here, just to keep any network rail employees on the call happy. This is something of an isolated event due to the exhaustive rolling program of remedial work undertaken by network rail. Okay, however, there is uh, a risk there, potential risk there, and at the moment, the risk mitigation is very, very um, naive. Let's say, um, basically, we've been told by. Uh, network rail engineers that if there is a suspected hidden shaft, um, the main way of uh, attempting to it is uh, by doing this. So when you get a possession on the railway, you send in a team with scaffolding, you send the team up, ideally with a very big drill, and they start drilling holes into the tunnel lining. And if the drill meets resistance, you have some confidence that there's no shaft. And if the drill doesn't meet resistance, it would appear that there's a shaft there. And that literally is the way these things are done at the moment, largely because there is no alternative. So back in 2019, having heard about muon tomography, uh, we were approached uh, by Network Rail through a, a, a another company called Central Alliance, who is a geo a technical services company based in Wakefield, uh, to um, give a pitch to Network Rail about me on tomography. Um, we uh, gave that pitch and very kindly Network Rail said, well, go away and prove the technique to us and we're going to send you off to a disused railway tunnel where there are known shafts and what we'd like you to do is spend a couple of weeks carefully imaging that disused railway tunnel and bring your results back and show us that muon tomography can actually indeed see the hidden shaft, sorry, the, 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 the open shafts. <clears throat> so the Alfreton tunnel, I've just given you an indicator for those of you who are not familiar with where Alfreton is, but it's uh, in North Nottinghamshire, uh, very close to, uh, not too far from Derby, in fact, just off the M1. Um, and the tunnel indeed is marked in red there. It's actually, a, it is a disused tunnel, but it's right next to a live tunnel, which uh, uh, serves the line between Alfreton and Long Eaton, if anybody on the call knows that part of the world. Now, this tunnel, as I say, was perfect for this proof of principle. We didn't have to worry about getting possessions to get access to the rail. Um, we were given essentially full rain to the almost 800 meter long tunnel over the course of a fortnight. And as some of the images you can see show, this particular tunnel had used these um, the shaft methods in the Victorian days to actually excavate it. And there were three, hidden, uh, three open shafts to the surface. Uh, so you could stand under them and see daylight, uh, which made it an ideal location for this proof of principle uh, neon tomography uh, experiment. So we, um, we put our instrumentation together. Our instrumentation is based on a plastic scintillator, which is 
essentially polystyrene dealt with chemicals that cause light to be produced when a charged muon passes through. Uh, we use plastic scintillator for a number of reasons. It's A, relatively cheap, B, very efficient, and C, uh, it doesn't carry any of the sort of problems that you have if you use something that's gaseous, for example, uh, where you have to worry about gas bottles and things like that. So it's a very practical uh, method for going out into the field. Um, the scintillation light is collected by photosensors. Those are sensors that essentially uh, detect light and turn that into an electrical signal. Those electrical signals go into a data acquisition system and everything was able to run in the back of a transit van and run off a battery where we, we, we could get 50 hours of operation per charge. The emphasis on this was, although it was a nice controlled experiment in some ways, was to uh, deliver a, 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 a cost first, you know, cost obviously was one of the issues, but robustness, the ability to reconfigure the system, uh, ideally remotely operate it and have a low budget, a low power budget as well. So just to give you a kind of feel for what happened, the, the systems deployed in the van are shown, it's segmented. And that segmentation enables us to actually say something roughly about the direction the muons have come in. We require what's known as a coincidence. So we require that, you see that the uh, detectors were uh, arranged in two planes. So we, we actually required signals in both planes before we actually said we'd seen a muon. And as I say, depending on which particular detector and which particular plane had been struck, we were able to actually say something about uh, the direction of the incoming muon. We took data typically for 20 to 30 minutes each point. And as network rider does to do a very fine scan of the whole tunnel, we actually moved five meters, re repeated five meters and repeated. And we did that eight hours a day for, for two working weeks, so for 10 days. So just to sort of really a little schematic really to sort of show you what's happening here. So there's a van in the tunnel. In areas where there's a full overburden, some of your muons get, uh, still get absorbed, but uh, some of them get, get through. As we move our van now to an area where there's uh, little to no overburden, what happens now is that the attenuation of the muons is less. And so more muons are recorded in the system, in the, in, in the muon tomography system. And so in that way, in principle, uh, you're able to say something about uh, the overburden above you from the muon rate that you detect. Uh, so we went into the tunnel, we um, took the data and the data looked as follows. So that's the 800 meter length tunnel. Uh, you can see in broad terms, things look very much as we expected. So as you enter the tunnel, the overburden, before we enter the tunnel, we're in open sky. And as we enter the tunnel, uh, you can see that the overburden uh, is increasing as we go into the tunnel. And so the muon rate drops because the material above us is increasing. Um, and then it drops to a minimum, the muon rate drops to a minimum, roughly around the middle of the tunnel where the middle with the overburden is the greatest. And then the thing reverses as you go out. So in broad terms, the data look more or less as you would expect them. We can now start to look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, the red line here is what our simulations tell us we would expect. Uh, so you can see that largely the data are in good agreement with our simulations. But as you can see from the gray lines here, the gray lines are the locations of the three open shafts. So this is the, where the shaft is open to the surface. And if we zoom in on that, area so if we zoom in so the here the blue lines are the open shafts now so if we zoom in on the open shaft at 220 meters in from the portal what we see is the following we see that our predicted rate which is the uh, amber colored uh, line is the rate of muons we would expect to see if there was a full overburden above us in other words uh, we had we had no uh, shaft above us now, obviously, we know there's a, an open shaft in, in three particular locations. And what you actually see when you sit directly under the open shaft at 220 meters, you see a huge jump in the muon flux rate. And in fact, that is equivalent to uh, 11 standard deviations. So if anybody knows uh, what we do in, 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 in science, we basically uh, will talk about um, 
uh, an indication of something at three standard deviations and we talk about a discovery at five standard deviations. So when the Higgs boson discovery was made at CERN um, almost 10 years ago now, they waited until they had sufficient statistics to have a five standard deviation uh, effect uh, with respect to uh, the prediction without Higgs, if you like. And this is exactly the same here, except we've got 11 standard deviations that's huge so there's no way basically it's about a one chance in several billion that we we've, we've got this wrong which we know we haven't anyway because we know that the shaft is there so that obviously gives you a lot of uh, confidence in the technique not only that you've got that huge statistical significance in just a 20 to 30 minute of data at each point so um and, and indeed if you look at all three known hidden shafts, you can see that, uh, sorry, excuse me, I keep saying hidden shafts. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you look at all three open shafts, you can see similar discrepancies, which is in line with the fact that we haven't got any overburden above us at that point. Now, if you look a little bit more closely at that plot, you will actually see that at 80 meters, there appears to be an anomaly and if you zoom in at 80 meters, this is what our data looks like. So again, our prediction. So at this point, we're actually still technically entering the tunnel in the sense that the overburden above us is still increasing. And you could see that from the, uh, the amber colored curve, which is decreasing. So that's telling us our muon rate should be going down as the overburden is increasing as we move towards the center of the tunnel. But as you can see, at 80 meters, there's a significant deviation between what we expect to see and what we actually observed with our instrumentation. So when we went back to Network Rail, we actually gave them the results, more or less as I'm talking to you today, virtually the same set of slides. And we said, um, we believe there's, there's, a, there's something at 80 meters. We believe you may have a, some sort of voiding at 80 meters. And it was very interesting because there was a tunnel asset manager in the room and a couple of other managers and they looked at one another and then looked at us and looked at one another and looked at us and they said, okay, we've got a little bit of a, an admission to make. Uh, we have a suspected uh, void. We have a, a suspected hidden shaft in that region, but we deliberately didn't tell you about it because we wanted to see if your instrumentation would find it. So I think at that point we'd, arguably passed the first test. So um, indeed, and, and in fact, what happened as a consequence of that is we were tasked to go back into the tunnel and to do a more finer resolution scan around that anomaly. And so what they asked us to do, whereas we'd done a sort of, if you like, an identification of an anomaly, they asked us to go back and spend more time uh, doing a characterization of that anomaly rather than just a simple identification. We went back with a slightly different system uh, pictured in the bottom right there. This bottom left, excuse me. This system is um, has finer resolution, finer angular resolution. We, when I said before that we could tell something about the di direction that the neon had come in, pointing upwards. Uh, if you remember that, that, that system was sort of six broken up into six uh, portions at the top and three at the bottom. This system was six at the bottom and six at the top. And so that actually gives you a finer resolution with looking up. But this one is naturally plastic scintillator. It's something we call a liquid scintillator. So it's min mineral oil, again, uh, with, a, in, with a, a chemical in that reacts to the charged particles going through and creates light. In this case, the, um, the material is something called uh, pseudocumene or pseudocamine, depending on how you say it. Uh, we spent a couple of days at, at uh, the site running, running the system. And indeed, uh, what we were able to do, because of the higher fidelity uh, data that we were taking, we were able to actually stitch uh, a number of images together and create this nice, uh, technically this is a 3D image because it's, uh, it's uh, an image in both longitudinal distance, transverse distance, and effective overburden as well. So what you can see from the image on the uh, left is that um, you can see the red spot is where the hidden shaft is. 
I would stress that there's no real, as you stand in the tunnel and look up, you've just got the brick lining, the tunnel lining, there's no evidence really for a shaft there, other than the fact that there's a little bit of water ingress, but there was water ingress in other parts of the tunnel as well. Um, and uh, not only are we able to say the position, the exact position of the anomaly, we're actually able to say something about its diameter, and we're also actually able to say, as I've said, uh, something about the effective overburden of that shaft. And what this has, this shaft has, is the equivalent of, this This is at 30 metres, we should have 30 metres of rock above us at this point, and the density of this uh, this overburden is, is a, a, a approximately equal to one metre. So it appears to be almost a, a full height hidden void with just the brick lining hiding it from, from eye inside the tunnel. So, um, so that hopefully gives you a little bit of a flavour for um, some of the things you can do with uh, what I call me on radiography to differentiate it from um, the, the next uh, technique I'm going to talk about, um, which is the, the analogy to the x-ray. So I'm now going to move on spend a little bit of time talking about a second technique and this technique goes by the name of muon scattering tomography and the only way it's different to the first technique with the first technique all you have to do is you have to do that x-ray type of thing where you have to have a, a detector where you put your image if you like sorry excuse me you put the object you want to image between the muons and the detector however if you are able to track the muon going into and coming out of the object of interest, so this now requires two sets of detectors, ideally above and below the object of interest, but to either side is also fine. Then in addition to density information, you also get explicit information about the nuclear makeup of material in that object, and, and in particular, the Z of the, the atomic Z, if you like. So whether this is carbon or hydrogen or lead or whatever. So that is, a, again, a very powerful technique, because again, it's, a, it's still a non-invasive and non-destructive technique. But now we have the capability of saying something about the actual nuclear makeup, the atomic makeup, if you like, of the material in the uh, thing of interest. And this is because as the muon comes into and enters the object of interest, it will undergo some level of scattering. And the amount of scattering it undergoes depends on the mass of any nuclei that it uh, encounters as it passes through uh, the object. So um, I first um, worked on this technique a few years ago now with a colleague who is now actually the, the managing director of our spin-out company, but at the time, this was of interest to the, uh, a, the Ministry of Defence as a possible demonstrate, possible technique to be applied for detecting contraband nuclear material hidden, for example, in cargo containers. So the rationale behind this is, and indeed in, in the US, a couple of full-size systems have been used and, and deployed. The rationale behind this is that you place your cargo container between two sets of detectors. So you probably drive up, this is obviously, this is a lab-based smaller version, but imagine this was life-size, you would probably have a ramp coming up, uh, driving in between those two sets of black boxes. Your, uh, your lorry with a cargo container on the back would sit in there ideally for a short period of time, maybe a few minutes. And then the idea behind this is that if any large, if any muons are seen entering the lorry or the cargo container, sorry, and actually exiting at quite a, 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 a big angle, that is indicative of heavy material in, in, the cargo, in the cargo container itself. Now, obviously there might be machine parts in that cargo container, but at the same time, if that container is supposed to be full of flour or salt or sugar, and you start seeing uh, large angle scatters like that, it's possible that you might want to take that on side and have a close look. This is all predicated around the concern that uh, small levels of contraband nuclear material could be smuggled across borders uh, in this manner. Um, another obvious application of this technique, 
is to, um, in the nuclear waste industry, um, much of the nuclear waste from the 1950s and 1960s is poorly documented. And again, using this technique, uh, muon scattering tomography actually allows us in principle to see inside nuclear waste containers and actually say something about the material in that container in terms of its said. And uh, what I'm going to show you in a few moments now is some um, results from some studies uh, that we've done as part of a large um, EU-sponsored um, consortium which was looking at developing new techniques to characterize intermediate level nuclear waste. Um, so let's move on. So what I would say as well is that this and the technique I've just been talking about, the Im imaging technique uh, that's analogous to the X-ray, the muon radiography technique, are both certainly of interest to the IAEA. Uh, and um, uh, uh, both of them have different, different applications, both in nuclear waste characterization, but also in principle in application in the safety and safeguarding of nuclear waste repositories as well. So here's some uh, nice thoughts one of my PhD students has done over the past couple of years. We asked ourselves, you know, can we use uh, this technique to say something not only about, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to, we, we, we embarked upon a two-stage process here. The first step we wanted to do is say, if there's objects of heavy material in, say, a concrete matrix, which is what most nuclear waste drums contain, either bitumen or concrete, can we identify where those objects are? And then the second stage to that problem was, after identifying where those objects are, can we say something about the nuclear makeup of those or the atomic makeup of those objects? And so we started off by some simple simulations based on cubes of uranium and lead in a concrete matrix or of different sizes. Uh, and as you can see quite clearly, um, you can actually fairly easily with the technique, uh, you're able to uh, determine where heavier materials are within the, the, the nuclear cask, the nuclear waste drum. And then the second part of this uh, which is depicted, I think I've got, yeah, I've got several ones of these, but it's depicted in the bottom uh, plot now, is showing us uh, what happens when you now start using machine learning techniques. So what we did here is we trained a number of um, multivariate algorithms and we trained them to identify lead, uranium and uh, iron and then each time we found an object in the cask, we basically told the algorithm to assign a probability of that object being either uranium or lead or iron, for example. And as, as you can see, in this case, with the large 15 centimeter cubes, it's, it's, got the, um, it's got the identification fairly spot on here. So here we're using the muon scattering tomography technique and the fact that the angle of scattering of the different materials in the simulated drum depends on whether it's uranium, it depends on the atomic makeup or the, you know, the, the, the Z of the material is what's helping us there. Uh, another similar plot here using smaller blocks now, you can see those cubes of material are smaller. And when they're smaller, it becomes a little bit more difficult in particular because iron and lead aren't too different in terms of their atomic mass. You could see in the middle plot here where we've got a, a block of lead, we still give lead the highest probability, but iron is quite high as well. And actually in the uranium block, you can see for the uranium block, it's technically been misidentified as lead, but uranium and lead both have a high probability there. So uh, another possible application for this type of technique is um, in the whole area of um, um, what, what, are, what are known in the trade as diversion scenarios. In other words, has um, a, a state actor got their hands or, or you know, state actor or uh, somebody working on behalf of a certain state actor got their hands on a, a drum and diverted materials from that drum. And so again, what's nice about the muon tomography technique 
in addition to it being non-invasive and non-destructive, uh, so you can image from the outside without having to open the drum or do anything with the drum, the muons, in addition, do not result in any residual uh, activation of the materials. When you start to interrogate nuclear materials with things like gamma rays and neutrons, which are other techniques that are used in this industry, you have to be a little bit careful about uh, activation or whether you're activating any of the materials in there. This is not a worry for the muon tomography technique. So uh, one of the things we've looked at, another PhD student of mine has looked at, is whether or not, if you were to divert, you would, you'd try to, um, uh, you know, engage some subterfuge here and divert only part of the um, payload of the nuclear waste container. Um, and we've, we've considered various scenarios here, bottom left shows various scenarios where you've taken the whole basket out, where, the, where you've taken half a basket out, or whether you've actually been even more uh, cheeky and you've actually taken uranium pellets out and replaced them with lead pellets. And uh, what we see in the top right is the topographic image from the scattering tomography technique in that, in that situation, where whole baskets have been, or half baskets have been taken out, the image to show that diversion has taken place. The scenario where lead has been used to replace the uranium uh, pellets is harder to see using this technique at the moment. Oh. So um, here is um, a little bit of, I just thought I'd say a few words. I've said, it, said a few words as I've gone along on the instrumentation, um, but um, here you can get a picture now uh, of some of the, so we're now working, we're about actually to uh, next month to embark on a new program of work, which is going to last about four months to image eight tunnels on the Wales and Western part of Network Rails Network. So we have uh, tunnels as far south as Cornwall and as far north as Gloucester to image. Um, and so what we've done, whereas in the past, um, the first work we did at Alfreton, uh, as you saw, uh, we did uh, that work with system in the back of a transit van. We don't have that luxury now. Uh, we have to uh, essentially um, by hand take our equipment out of our van and place it on what's known as a permit equip trolley, a trolley which basically sits on the rail track and then is, is rolled into the tunnel. So we've ruggedized our system. You can see on the top left there, these are plastic scintillator paddles again with the PMTs attached to them, but they've now been ruggedized. They're sitting in compressed foam and they've got, they sit in a nice, what's known as a pelly case, a nice industrial uh, case. We're also now for other applications in the oil and gas industry. If you're interested in the Q&A, ask me a little bit more about that, but for the oil and gas industry and also for the carbon capture and storage industry, and uh, now starting to produce a borehole format uh, detector. Uh, that has advantages and disadvantages. Boreholes are used a lot in uh, a number of, a number of um, industries, including the mining industry as well, which is an area that we're having some preliminary discussions uh, on. Uh, but um, with the muon tomography technique in general, the larger the surface area of instrument you can deploy, the faster that you uh, you get your image, basically. So as with a borehole detector, obviously you're reducing the, the surface area of your instrument, so it will imply longer times to, to make images as a, as a consequence of that. And um, one of the things that you probably saw there uh, is a, a drone coming down onto a back of a, a barge. And that was a little bit of work we did back in February, which again, very much a proof of principle there, where we deployed um, a detector as part of an autonomous swarm. Uh, and one of the interests there is the use of such imaging techniques to look for defects in um, wind turbine blades for offshore wind turbines, which are notoriously difficult to, um, to access and also to, to, uh, you know, to, to, to get information on. So as the title of my talk included, I think, positioning or navigation or whatever, I should just say a few words about this. This is um, something that uh, is kind of a, a newer addition to our portfolio. 
And this is the idea of using um, muon information, again, because muons are penetrating particles, to, uh, to actually do positioning in, um, particularly at latitudes uh, above the Arctic Circle, where uh, you're largely GPS denied. So because of the way all the um, global satellites are positioned uh, to serve, I mean, the, the majority of the world's population is sits between the, um, the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic Circle. And so uh, most of the satellite, a few satellites are circum circumpolar, for example, as positioning satellites, navigation satellites, GNS, uh, or GPS. And so certain parts uh, of the, uh, the world above the um, Arctic Circle in particular uh, are largely GPS denied or they have poor quality GPS GNSS. And so um, this is not, it's an idea that came out of, actually out of our colleague in Japan, the guy who's done a lot of the work on the imaging of volcanoes. Um, and it's, the, the idea is you use uh, muons, uh, you have a reference system. So in this case, the application here on the top left is for an underwater positioning um, uh, system where you have a number of reference detectors that have been synchronized to a detector that you're going to take underwater. Uh, and you basically synchronize those using a clock and then you um, essentially cut that synchronization. So you have two grandmaster clocks. They're now running non-synchronized, but their drifts are such that, particularly if you use the higher grade grandmaster clocks, uh, their drifts are such that um, you can just get a few tens of nanoseconds per several days, for example, which is enough if, as long as you're able to communicate between the two systems by another technique such as acoustic to actually transmit information and get positioning information as a consequence of that. So uh, if you're interested, the uh, article on the bottom right there appeared in uh, Nature just before Christmas. I think it was December the 6th or December the 12th or something like that. And the uh, screenshot there is uh, from a... Um, an announcement made by the ONR, which is the Office of Naval Research in the US, which uh, in collaboration with uh, the US Army's, one of the US Army's uh, research uh, arms has um, funded uh, a program of work uh, and, and it's ourselves working with Japanese and Finnish colleagues. And uh, next spring, will be deploying instrumentation um, on a frozen lake uh, up in the north of Finland, uh, very close to the Norwegian border, uh, a lake called Kilpisjarvi, uh, where we'll actually deploy reference detectors on the surface of the lake. And then under the lake, uh, we'll have an ROV with another detector, uh, and we'll be proving uh, this technique uh, in high, high, lat high, high latitudes uh, next spring, which uh, promises to be an interesting, uh, interesting field trip. Uh, finally, I think this is my last slide. I'm quite hopefully within time. Yeah. Um, just an, another application of muons. Uh, I've talked about muons for, for imaging. I've talked about muons for positioning. So uh, another really nice area that we're exploring at the moment is uh, the use of muon-induced secondaries. Um, and there's a couple of areas in particular of interest here. So basically, as muons enter the uh, earth, enter the ground, as I say, they're very penetrating, but some of the low energy muons in particular do interact and they get attenuated. Um, and typically, if they interact, they will often uh, produce neutrons as a result of that interaction. And those neutrons can re-exit the ground for those neurons that interact just in the first few centimeters of the ground. Uh, those neutrons can actually get back out of the ground. Um, now, it turns out that the, the new number of neutrons you see as a consequence of that is correlate or inversely correlated to the water content, because neutrons uh, get absorbed or get thermalized by hydrogen. So the more water there is in the ground, the fewer the neutrons you see, and the less water there is, the more neutrons that you see. 
Now, this is this was actually a real eye opener to me because there's a, there's a whole industry in this in, on the agri tech side of things, which I wasn't aware of, uh, despite the fact I've worked with muons and neutrons for most of my career. Um, and there are a lot of um, helium three based detectors out there. The nice thing about this is you can put a detector on a pole, probably about three or four meters off the ground, in fact, and that is sensitive to rather a large area, maybe hundreds plus meters in diameter, and it's sensitive to the water content in that, uh, in that uh, area. So in principle, this is an excellent way of saying something about groundwater saturation, which could obviously help farmers. Uh, and it's one of the things we're exploring, is well, one of the things we, we are doing is actually looking at um, producing lower cost versions of the ne neutron instrumentation because helium three based detectors are rather expensive. Um, now, the other area that it, we, we find this is um, of interest to, and there is going to be a, a press release about this in the fairly near future now, is this, this same technique whereby you uh, have muons that enter the ground, interact with something in the ground and create neutrons, um, can indicate the number of neutrons you see can also not only can it be an indicator of the presence of water it can be an indicator of the presence of heavy elements and so it turns out so what we have um as, as a company as a spin-out company have done is we've put together a system which is not only a muon detector system it's a muon and neutron detector system combined which in principle could be plopped on somebody's drive and within uh, a, a fairly short period of time, tell an engineer whether there is a, a, a high or low probability for there to be a lead pipe in that area. And this is particularly of interest to the water companies at the moment. So I'm sure you're aware most of the water companies in the, in the country have a rolling program to reduce the lead pipe, in particular the lead pipes coming up to domestic properties. Uh, and what we're told by our Partner Seven Trends, who uh, we've signed a collaboration agreement with uh, on this work, is that you know they they do find themselves often on the understanding that there's a lead pipe on a property, only to dig up a drive and find there's no lead pipe, and of course that's costly to the industry. And so what we're hoping is this this system that uh, we've we've pioneered here, this combined muon and neutron system, could in principle help that industry. Uh, going forward. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm kind of 25, uh, 55 minutes out, so just where I wanted to be. So hopefully I've given you a flavour for muon tomography. Hopefully I've, you know, I've hopefully got across to you the, 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 the take-home messages. It's a mature and well-established uh, technology. It's good for imaging uh, in a non-invasive and uh, non-destructive uh, manner. Uh, and it, it, it utilizes the free flux of highly penetrating cosmic rays that um, we uh, otherwise, uh, you know, which are there and, and come down freely. It's been famously used to look at pyramids, volcanoes, what I didn't mention today, but it was also used to look at the Fukushima nuclear af reactor after meltdown, just to try and understand the state of the core. Um, it's really fair to say that this technique is going a huge, undergoing a huge renaissance and Every year I learn more applications from imaging architectural buildings to looking for ore bodies in mines um, to imaging blast furnaces, for example. So the, the, the technique is undergoing a real renaissance, having first been used more than 70 years, or well, almost 70 years ago now. Um, and hopefully also I've, I've I've given you a flavour for the fact that there's a couple of different techniques here, one which is just the, the, the extra analogy and the other which actually can in principle provide uh, some useful information to the nuclear industry as well. So on that note, I'll thank everyone for their attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lee. That was, that was really interesting. Um, are there any questions from the floor? Uh, well, I have an extension to the uh, applications that have just been discussed. I arrived a bit late, so I didn't catch the first uh, half an hour or so. Um, Bethy Colombo is a um, 
an ESA mission to Mercury. And on Bethy Colombo, there is, uh, there are a range of detectors, including X-ray and neutron detectors for all the usual reasons that um, spacecraft going to planets uh, carry. Um, as I understand it, they're also going to be used to detect the composition of the surface of Mercury. Uh, this is cosmic ray um, bombardment of the surface, um, giving off uh, neutrons and X-rays, I think it is. I think it's X-rays as well. Yeah. And, the, and even though the neutron detector and the X-ray detector on the Mars, uh, Mars Mercury Polar Orbiter uh, is very wide, has a very wide field of view by a complex process of um, the polar orbiting spacecraft going around Mercury over the poles, they'll be able to actually get quite a good resolution of the, um, the inferred composition of um, parts of the surface of Mercury by counting the, um, the neutrons in particular, I think. So that's, you know, there's a lot of uh, interesting applications of raw cosmic rays. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, on the application of imaging volcanoes, um, the detectors were placed to the uh, to the side for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, what sort of um, attenuation is there in the muon flux as opposed to um, a detector that was imaging vertically? Okay, so um, it's more so that obviously um you have you know all the all the all the rock thickness of the volcano to get through so that tends to be very very specific to the particular geology of the volcano that you're imaging the other thing that is worth um pointing out in that respect is that your maximum flux is at the vertical and it drops off as a, as a cos squared theta so so you're fighting you're not only fighting the fact that you're trying to image through uh, you know, a, a certain mass, but you're actually, your flux is lower than it would be if you're able to get underneath uh, the volcano, for example. Nevertheless, as you saw there, you know, there was fairly coarse resolution um, images on a sort of every couple of days that image updated. You know, bear in mind that, you know, if you've got a, you know, if, you, if you've got a, a meter squared table in front of you, there's 10,000 muons per minute passing through that meter squared table um, at, at, at sea level. Uh, you know, they are plentiful, these things. <laughs> yep. Can, can I have a question, Paul? Um, Please. Lee, you showed a picture of the tomography application for effectively looking, looking at shipping containers. Um, you showed a sort of a lab, a lab scale one and hinted that the Americans had actually built a couple of these. How long does a shipping container have to sit there bef being imaged before you get any idea what's in it? That's a really good question. So I think what the, the rationale behind that was always um, as follows. Um, you, would, you wouldn't have enough time to make an image of the cargo container without the port grinding to a halt, basically. So the rationale behind that was always that, um, depending on who you talk to and which port authority you talk to, you get figures of between 30 and 90 seconds per container. Now, you're not going to get an image of the container in that time. But again, it's quite possible if you had some illicit materials in a container, you would see a a number of, again, bearing in mind, you've got 10,000 muons every square meter of the roof of the container going per minute going through it. Um, if you start to see a number of large angle scatters in your instrumentation, and you look at the manifest and it says flour or sugar, the rationale there was always there would be a secondary search, there would be a secondary technique. Uh, and it was so this was just, if you like, a sort of first level 
sort of filter, which is not a yes, no, it's a yes, maybe. Yes, you're okay to go. Sorry, it's a, excuse me, it's not a yes, no, it's a no, maybe filter. It's a no, you've not got anything. Maybe you have got something, go over there and we'll have a closer look. Yeah. Hopefully that answers your question, Andrew. I have a, a question. Uh, all these applications uh, appear to use uh, uh, naturally uh, produced uh, muons. Uh, is there a possibility of artificially uh, producing uh, uh, new, uh, muons for, for uh, uh, maybe a portable type applications uh, where the uh, natural muon flux is not, uh, not high enough? That's a sort of holy grail, and it's interesting actually because I was asked that same question at a, a nuclear waste conference in Luxembourg last week, and my answer was exactly the same. I said that that's, well, that's a, a holy grail, and it would be wonderful to have such a thing. To which the person who posed the question answered, "We are looking at developing one." So I'm not aware of any such device at the moment. But I was told last week that there are people looking into such devices. Obviously, if you've got the capability of turning up even on a truck or something with, with, with such a device, then, you know, all these limitations have been able to, you know, being forced to image either through an object by placing a system underneath an object or to the side of an object. You would lose all that if you've got to control over the position and the um, and, and the direction of a muon source. Yeah, I don't know any more details than that because certainly I'm not aware of anything that's suitably portable or compact. There are sort of accelerator centres that create muons, but obviously these are done at huge, you know, huge accelerator sites, and I don't know of anything at the moment that's suitably portable or compact to do that. If it would, then the sky's the limit, I think. Are there any more questions for our speaker from the floor? Yeah, I have a very quick question for Lee. Uh, excellent talk, by the way. Um, um, Thank you. What are, what are the um, uh, machine learning classification techniques, algorithms you, you used for your material identification? So we used something called uh, a boosted decision tree. We looked at a number of different techniques, actually, including uh, standard neural networks. Um, so there's a well, within particle physics, we have a really nice package, which actually is essentially a, 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 a suite of ten different. I think it's ten different multivariate analysis techniques that you can actually throw at a problem, and as long as you've got a, 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 a two data sets you can train with one and classify with another, it will actually tell you what is the best technique to use for your particular problem. So in this case, the uh, what's called the boosted decision tree technique was uh, the one that actually gave the best results. Interesting, thank you. Um, Lee, can I just take you back to your work for Network Rail, an organisation yes. I've I've crossed swords with in the past? Um, <laughs> just to go back to your original uh, demonstration, and I know how sceptical they can be of anything new. You identified that you thought there were two sites where you might have found voids. Um, you found the one, sort of the the one they suspected. Did the other one get investigated or did they decide just to shrug their shoulders and leave it? No, we, 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 we so the one was a site that um, they had suspicions over and we went back and imaged that. We also did image the other area as well. And with the finer resolution instrumentation, uh, we saw nothing that was of suit, that was of a statistical significance that we felt was worth jumping up and down about. And indeed, when we relayed that back to Network Rail, they, they sort of essentially confirmed that mm -hmm. uh, there, was no, there was no suspicions around that area. 
you know, I could see the application for mining as well, because that's one badly documented Swiss cheese in some places. Yeah, it, it's, it's, un, it's, it's undocumented mine workings. I mean, we've talked recently to a group of people who work out in the Peak District. And, uh, you know, I was amazed to learn that, you know, they've got mine workings going back to the 1600s and uh, poor documentation. And it's also in principle as well, all body imaging. There's, we, have a, we have a group of um, contemporaries, another university spin out in Canada, who very successfully uh, done some work on nickel and uranium ore body imaging in Canada, uh, whereby, you know, if you can go into a mine and you, in principle, look in that direction and you know what the host rock is, if you see, and then you can predict your muon flux based on that host rock, if you see um, a reduction in the muon flux, then that tells you that you've got something denser in that direction than you expect. And it's, uh, it's, it's one of the ways of, uh, in principle, looking for high density ore bodies as well. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, could I ask a question, please? Go ahead, Anne. Um, the chemical used in the plastic scintillator, is that a fossil? Is that a, a fossil? Yeah. Uh, it, it's... Um, it's no is it a phosphor it's a good question um it's i don't think it is it's something so there's a number of uh, chemicals that we can use one is called ppo one is called popop one is called bit msb and the other one's called peter for you know what they do is they they largely capture and and shift light up into the part of the spectrum where um where uh the photomultiplier tube has greatest sensitivity. Mm. Um, now, whether I'm not a chemist, so I couldn't swear to okay. whether they were are technically a phosphor or not. It's my area. It's my my field for my PhD. My PhD right. was in so uh, it's one of those things. As soon as I sort of hear scintillators and things, I always think because I think can't think sulfide silver. I think can detect muons. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's no. a, that's a standard one that's used as well in what we call yeah. inorganic. Yeah, inorganics. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That certainly is used. Uh, the the ones that we uh, use are things, as I say, uh, that they usually got um, they've usually got benzene chains in them, so they've got yeah. lots of delocalized electrons. Uh, I'm not a chemist, so you probably you, you've exhausted my chemistry Sorry. knowledge now. But uh, no, no. Uh, but I, I think I understand they've got a lot of de delocalized electrons and that's the mm -hmm. thing that enables the light to get captured and turned into an electrical signal yeah because the, yeah. the, orga the organic rings are usually more e efficient than the inorganic but less stable aren't yeah. they so yes yeah. that's right yeah thank you no oh, I, I i love getting asked questions like that actually i'm going to go and check that whether it's a phosphor or not now because you asked me that so uh, those questions are good Lee, do you always use uh, photomultipliers or have you explored uh, the solid state photomultipliers? Yeah, we, we're, we're using, yeah, we're using silicon PMs now, SIPMs as we call them, silicon photomultipliers, yeah. Um, it, it depends on the application basically, but because um, the SIPMs obviously have got much smaller surface area, but then if you can bring light out, for example, on a, an optical fibre, it, it's, it's, it's much more convenient, yeah. So no, I mean, the, the the cost of the silicon photomultipliers now uh, is just ridiculous. I mean, we're buying them, you know, in 20, 30, 40 pounds a time, you know, whereas photomultiplier tubes are, you know, hundreds of pounds. So, um, yeah. So we're, we're using both, basically. Yeah. Thank you. Unless there are any other questions, I'm going to move on. Is there any, any other question? I'd hate to cut anybody off. I'd, I'd just finish by saying one thing, Paul, because yes. I'm, I'm, I'm almost sort of introducing the next part of this. But what I would say is one of the ways I got into this whole business was uh, I started a few, quite a few years ago now on a project to build low cost cosmic ray detectors for schools. And so that's what got me into playing with plastic scintillator. And then I ended up with a small project with AWE and a colleague from AWE in my lab saying, what's this? And I said, well, it's plastic scintillator for schools. And the rest, as they say, is history. So uh, sometimes it's really interesting the way these uh, 
these things turn out. This whole thing really, if I trace it back, is a result of uh, trying to build low cost detectors to take into schools to show school kids how, uh, how, how we've got this wonderful naturally occurring radiation all around us. And that is a great introduction, for which I thank you, to the <laughs> second part of our evening. Um, just before I hand over to uh, Andrew Thomas, I just want to say thank you, Lee, for your time. I know you must be incredibly busy, but the effort you put into preparing for us and presenting tonight was, was well worth it. That was great. Um, thank you. Thank you very That's much. A pl pleasure. Yeah. You gave a standing pleasure. ovation if we were in the, in the real world. But it's a bit more difficult in this virtual one that we <laughs> that we have. Um, Thank you very much. That's very kind. It's a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, OK, without further ado, um, Andrew and um, I'll, I might chip in as well. Um, we're going to take us into the second part of the evening after that great introduction from um, from Lee there. Andrew. Right. Uh, good evening, everybody. With luck, you should be able to see a slide. Yes, um, that worked. Now, those, some of you in the audience probably were here for Spencer Axani's presentation some months ago, like during the summer of last year from memory, where he presented a, a school's project. And the, uh, the link from Lee is greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Um, he presented something called Cosmic Watch, which he, he and colleagues had developed at MIT. And the questions after that presentation, several of them were along the lines of, well, where can I buy one? Um, and I hope I can, uh, will be able to answer that question for you this evening. Um, firstly, a little bit of background. Now, we've had a, a lovely presentation about some very big detectors, um, big enough to require a transit van to drive them around. Um, the principle of, of the cosmic watch detector is exactly the same. Um, it's a block of scintillator material. It's got a solid state um, photomultiplier attached to it, some electronics and a counter circuit. And if you put two of them together, as again was nicely illustrated for surveying tunnels, you get a, you get a detector that has a a window looking in a particular direction. Now for an astronomy point of view, up is a good direction. And there you see a nice little illustration of how you could actually make a, a pair of stacked detectors. Now you stack them together to control the field, field of view so they don't just look sort of uh, straight out the side. Um, cut it down to a few degrees. So two detectors working together. One detector on its own will detect the, uh, your background radiation, including local sources of radiation. So those of you with old um, luminous watches will be able to detect, detect them. Um, somebody told me that air, old aircraft instruments are highly radioactive. And I think you'll also find that if you still have a trim phone, that's radioactive as well. So moving on, two, two pieces of stack scintillator and Paul's very helpfully done some maths here. It's about 135 degrees window looking upwards. If you move them further apart, that window closes, but you run the risk of getting counts that are local radiation going through both, both detector blocks. Now, those of you who remember Spencer Axani's Cosmic Watch, the questions were so encouraging that uh, here at UCRE, the Radio Astronomy Association, we took it upon ourselves to talk to Spencer and he was very happy for us to take his design and build and sell kits. His original project was to get his students to actually build and operate an instrument and gather their own data. So he was very keen that kits were the way to go. Now we appreciate that a lot of people don't like soldering up very small surface mount components. So we took it upon ourselves that we would also sell 
assembled assembled kits. Now here we have a little picture of the guts of the kit. The scintillator block, it's five centimeters square and one centimeter thick. So a, that's a detector volume of 25 cubic centimeters. The little chip at the bottom is a six millimeter silicon photomultiplier. That's what we use to actually detect the scintillating light. And with our kits, those, the scintillator particularly, we sell it polished, drilled and tapped. So there's no necessity for the customer to do the laborious, frankly laborious task of polishing a plastic block. It's not that hard, but it is, it is time consuming. And we think that's somewhere where we add value. We really, I think what the value we add is we combine the components in bulk, not huge bulks, but enough that you can secure a very significant dis discount. Um, just to give you some idea, if I can go backwards, that six millimeter square of silicon, um, if you want to buy one, it will cost you about 60 pounds plus VAT. We secure them at a very substantially lower price than that. And that's the sort of thing where we, we help our customers by trying to control the costs. Um, on the bottom right there, there's one that Paul made earlier. Um, they're quite neat. They fit in a pretty small box and there's not really very much more to say. I've built two of them. They both worked. No, one worked the first time um, and one I did find a, a dry joint on, which didn't take an awful lot, of, awful lot of finding as it was on the power side. So for those who like a construction project and are dexterous with a soldering iron, um, it's a good kit to build. Uh, for those of you like myself, I can actually see surface, the very small surface mount components um, with a magnifying glass. We, we sell them with those small components already installed because we have a, one of our volunteers um, is very adept and adroit at making um, surface mount boards. So the customer just has the, the larger components like the LED and the connectors, um, some of the uh, uh, linking connectors to join the, this sub-assembly to the main circuit board, for example, solder the connector on the back of these uh, little low LED screens. Um, and for those who don't like building things at all, we sell them fully, fully assembled. And just to finish the job off neatly, they come with a nice uh, extruded aluminium box where we get the, the end plates um, machined out of a laser cut out of acrylic. So all the uh, connectors and the, the aperture for the OLED screen line up line up very, very neatly. Um, the, we have stock of all these things and they're on sale, on sale on our website. And that's the end of the commercial. Thank you very much. If, yeah, if, if I can just add, um, this project started in the, um, in, in the physics lab because Dr. Exani wanted his students to get their hands dirty basically. And it was a great, education projects for teaching electronics and coding, debugging, and building something for a real world um, experiment. Now, um, I've had several conversations with our local UTCs who are very excited about the possibilities that this can afford them in teaching. Um, well, in their context, it was A-level physics and the particle physics module. Um, if there's anybody on the call tonight that is an educator, um, and thinks that this may well be useful, then do get in touch with us um, because there are uh, fantastic possibilities for, uh, for teaching students. And particularly in, um, 
in, in well-funded sixth form colleges and the UTCs. The UTCs I visited have been very well, um, very well equipped and could um, and and would be able to uh, surface mount, you know, solder these devices together. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Thanks, Andrew. Are there any are there any questions that we can address for you? Well, just to ask about the um, the science that you could do with these, um, uh, you gather the you gather the signals in some in some way. Can you um, can you just expand on that a little bit? Um, can we get a Raspberry Pi into the act? <laughs> yes, um, I I've done that. I I have done that um, here behind me, uh, flashing away in a processed processing in a with a with a raspberry pi um the data that uh, comes out of the device is on a a file uh, on uh, on a um, on a micro usb card which is all oh. integrated um uh. there is a serial <laughs> there is a serial port and there are uh, python um downloads where the uh, raw data can be taken into um, well into anything basically, um, but uh, Python and a Raspberry Pi is is an obvious choice, particularly if you are an educator. Um, and the um, it, it, it's very easy to get the raw data from the print board itself. So that would be a a pulse for each event that is between fifty millivolts and 2.6 volts, depending on the, um, uh, the, the and, and that amplitude is a function of the energy of the muon and the path length within the scintillator, and that data comes out, um, uh, and, and, and that's what I use myself. In fact, I, I don't use the uh, file from the micro USB card. I take the raw data from the electronic straight into a GPIO on a on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, Paul's being a little too modest. He actually built the coincidence circuit and does the counting on a, on a Raspberry Pi. Um, what it, what we, we, if those of you remember Spencer's presentation, he had a view for us. I think technically this is the Mark II version. He had a view for the Mark III of generating a an online collaboration of real time. Hmm. data submitted by people across a wide area and certainly that's something we at Euclid will be very interested in making making happen um, and collaborating with the the idea of having a group of like-minded individuals over a say a county sized area it will be interesting to see whether you did see localized peaks for particular events um, we rather cheekily drew up a, uh, a, a big poster for our uh, stand at Winchester, BAA Winchester weekend and at the Kettering show of a large shower of muons in the, coming down from a very brightly glowing Beetlejuice. It's in the medium term. We're quite keen to design a Mark III where the data would have a GPS location and uh, and timestamp uh, yep. with the with Wi-Fi connect connectivity and upload to a central server. But all this is um, you know it, it's in our, it's inside our heads at the moment and not yet realised. But it is something that we want to uh, develop going forward once we get. Um, enough of you know en enough interest basically and if there's anybody yeah. on the call tonight that has <coughs> those kinds of skills that would like to collaborate with us do be in touch mm. yeah I, I just to pick up that point um collaboration is a good thing it'd be great to uh to take that further and even if you take the what you do with the data further the detector remains as useful as it was when it was built. Um, this becomes a, an, an add-on rather than a, a replacement. We're, we're not like Apple. We don't want to uh, junk your old equipment. So um, 
just a couple of comments. Um, so, I mean, very large area air showers of cosmic rays are well well established. If you look at um, the OJ experiment in uh, South America, for example, that was a series of detectors spread over thousands of square kilometers, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, uh, looking at the highest energy um, air showers. So, I mean, if you're able to timestamp uh, information and, you know, you have these even distributed in, in different areas of the UK, there may be some genuine science you can do with this. Um, that's the first thing I would say. In terms of kind of grouping um, people together, there's, so as I say, my journey started out with this. So at that time, which is a while ago now, there were a couple of quite successful groupings of um, cosmic ray enthusiasts, uh, largely doing it for high schools and the like. So the one was um, in the US, I think he went by the name of, of Alta, A-L-T-A, and then there were various, various spin-offs of that, like Walter, which was the Washington -y version, and Salter and things like that. And uh, I think if my memory serves me correctly, the original idea and some of the in dis instrumentation design came out of Fermilab. I honestly don't know where that is at the moment and how that's developed or maybe it's just uh, died a death. And the other one which was I was involved with was a um, was an initiative that came out of NICEV, which is the uh, Dutch equivalent of the Rutherford Lab in the UK, really. Um, and they had a system called HiSpark, which was HI mm. hyphen Spark yep. with a C. And um, they again, uh, their, their, their drawback was that they had some very nice but bespoke electronics, which was really cost prohibitive for schools to buy. Yeah. And um, so what you're doing here now, which is using essentially uh, commodity electronics, and of course, you know, the world's a very different world now, 15 years on or whatever, we, we now do have FPGAs and uh, SBCs, single ball computers, and, and, and Raspberry Pis, etc. So you're able to do this now at much lower cost than they were doing with their bespoke uh, electronics. So, but there may be there may be lessons to be learned from that. And as I say, you know, there may be genuinely science to be done. I have a I have a very good uh, friend and close colleague in uh, Colombia who works on uh, OSHA. So, and, and he's a, a very big. Um, He's very big into, uh, 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 you know, uh, public science and uh, all that side of things. So uh, he'd probably be able to give some pointers if you wanted to go further down that direction. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, Lee. I might uh, contact you offline and, and, and take that discussion further and talk contact details. Yeah, I, I knew about High Spark. Um, there's a was a poster exhibition out in the Institute of Physics. They have a they have a cloud chamber sort of built into a table in their foyer. And there was quite a bit about a, they did a high spark installation with a local school um, up on their roof. But it, again, it, as you say, it was quite clearly a very expensive piece of equipment and yep. well out of reach of the, the, the amateur investigator doing it for fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so as I understand, uh, Two of these uh, boards would be required in order to uh, discriminate uh, muons from other uh, incident uh, radiation. Uh, so uh, would also a coincidence uh, circuit be uh, needed in order to uh, correlate uh, uh, signal from, from the two boards? Uh, yes, let me just pop the, uh, that one. Right, that should put the uh, the uh, yes the um, the coincidence circuitry is actually built in built into the boards. Um, there's a jack plug on the uh, if you can just see there. There's a three and a half mil audio type jack plug on the board, and the idea is you use just a, a basic sort of mono mono bit of mono audio cable to link the two together and then press the button and they go into a master and slave mode. So the master uh, reacts to everything and counts everything it sees and the slave only counts things that happen within a 30 millisecond window 
of events that are seen on the master. So the counting is actually built in. Um, Paul's little uh, logic circuit does it a little more uh, on a, in an offline, an off off board uh, way. Um, both get the same results, and it's yeah, it's it's it is built in, or you can build your own. Uh, would would there be a uh, uh, an incentive to manufacture a uh, a board that uh, that includes uh, two detectors that would be uh, integrated in, into a single unit that would be usable for uh, for uh, muon counting? You put your finger nicely on one of the features for Mark Three. Exactly. Uh, yes. <laughs> And, and is there, is there a uh, timeline where, when that might be uh, uh, available? Um, the answer to that is no, there isn't. Um, we're, we built our, our first batches and you know, we're, we're totally a volunteer, voluntary and volunteer not-for-profit. Um, if they sell, that would encourage us to do more. If they don't sell, well, <laughs> nobody wants them. So we are very much putting our toe in the water at the moment. But yes, there, there is a thought that a, a double board. The, the only argument against that, just to play devil's advocate, is if you've got two separate boxes, you can experiment with the spacing and even putting them end to end to give yourself a much more focused device. So there's pros and cons both ways. I don't know whether uh, Lee yeah. has any views on how about integrating the uh, uh, the scintillator and uh, photo detector diode into a uh, uh, sort of a uh, uh, extended uh, unit that could be manipulated and then uh, feed into the central board so that you could use those different uh, orientations? Perhaps. Yes, there's the, there are, there are, as we say over here, there's a lot of ways of skinning a cat. And yes, it is a it is a thought in our mind at the moment, but it's not a uh, not something we've started working on seriously yet. Uh, are any design or, or circuit uh, uh, information available for those? Um, yes, if you go to the Cosmic Watch website, um, just Google Cosmic Watch Muon. Um, if you just Google Cosmic Watch, you get a lot of watches. I'm not sure I've got a link in here. No. Um, yes, if you go, if you Google Cosmic Watch Muon um, as an MIT website, all the circuit diagrams are available. Um, the there's a light, really nice science paper which describes in quite a lot of detail what it does, and some of the um, initial experiments that Spencer did with it. You know, taking it flying on airplanes, taking it to the South Pole, down a mine. Um, based on what I've heard this evening, taking it on a train journey. Right. I see. Thank you very much. So I have a question. <clears throat> Would the, do you know what the lifetime is of the energy that uh, causes the light in the uh, scintillation plastic? It's very short, I believe, isn't it? Yeah. Have you got a handle on that one, Paul? No, uh, we're talking about the um, the lifetime of the light pulse within the scintillator, or the yeah. lifetime of the SIPM itself, in terms of the no, number the of pulse. The, yeah, yeah, the pulse. Yeah, um, I it's it's it, nanoseconds. I think. It, it, yes, it, it's 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 tens of nanoseconds. That's right, and the electronics. Um, <clears throat> processes that pulse to give you a millisecond, I think, or two uh at, at its output so that it it lasts long enough for the uh little arduino to process and display and count okay thank you so so is that signal going into a uh, ad port for the uh, arduino is that being uh, yes. characterized okay thank you And all the all the Arduino code is open source and on the Cosmic Watch website. 
that's the one of the beautiful things with this project. Um, everything is is available for download in terms of documentation. It's very well specified from that from from that point of view. Is it easy to obtain the plastic uh, scintillation material if I, if you just wanted to experiment with that? Uh, yes, you can uh, buy it on eBay. Okay. That number you had on there is the one you're using, I guess, micro FC-635. Yeah, I think that's the manufacturer's part number for that for that scintillator that we're using. That's right. Yeah, and it does actually, we, we have to get it shipped across the Atlantic. Right. We do get it in, we do buy quantity of it. I've experimented. I, I used. I'm retired now, but I used to build uh, optoelectronic components, and I had in mind to do something like this with uh, like an array of detectors, you know. But I was concerned about the uh, the short life of the of the flash that you get out of the thing. Mm. So it is a little bit tricky. But uh, if with an array, you could actually get a little more information about direction and, and then stacking them on top of that so you could begin to develop an image possibly of which which direction it came from yeah it's, it's, an, it's an interesting project to play with as now i've only just got mine mine built and working paul's been running his for a, quite a lot longer and we know one or two people around and in this group have been running geiger muller tube based ones for some years are there any more questions from anybody? Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for that, Andrew. Great explanation. Um, and thanks again to, uh, to Lee. And I'll say good night and see you next month. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Cheerio. Bye-bye now. Cheerio.